So we were able to find kind of analytically the, or guided you through finding analytically the normal mode solutions, but to, you know, those two solutions correspond to either displacing the two masses by the same amount in the same direction and releasing them. So it's a special initial condition or displacing them by the same amount in opposite directions. So a second special initial condition. Um, I, there are many, many other solutions of the coupled differential equation uh, for different initial conditions. And those will be, um, those will be much harder for us to solve anal analytically here, especially in the general case of where you don't have two masses and three springs, but you have three masses, four springs, and so on and so forth. So now I want to turn to how, how we'll solve it numerically. <clears throat> so basically, we're going to use um, a method that we used in the last couple of classes, we kind of used it for the heat equation, uh, which uh, was a partial differential equation, uh, and the function was a function of space and time. And we used it for the wave equation, another partial differential equation where we had a function that was a function of space and time. Um, so we're going to use the leapfrog method here to, starting from the solution at one time, leap forward to the solution at the next time. That's all the leapfrog method really means. Um, but to make it more accurate in this case, I just wanted to um, introduce or, or, or mention a bit more terminology. So you can make the leapfrog method a, a bit more, more stable uh, by one of these two methods here. And uh, let me just describe what drift kick drift is and kick drift kick is. So they're, they're two sort of um, adjustments to that leapfrog method uh, to make it more stable over time. So in the leapfrog method, if we divided our time into little time steps or time step ticks, we kind of just step to the next time and recalculate things and then step to the next time and recalculate things. So if I was to describe that in this language of drifts and kicks, we kind of, we would either drift over here and then kick it, or we could like um, kick it, which means, you know, uh, accelerate it and then, then drift. But that's not very symmetric about that step, right? If you kick, then drift, or if you drift, then kick. So you, you get the idea of what these two methods do is they make it more symmetric. So um, in this method on the left-hand side, first we just drift halfway across the time interval. Then we apply the kick. So that's where we accelerate and change the velocity. And then we drift the second half of the time interval. So it's more symmetric. And then this other method over here, kick, drift, kick. Um, this is where we initially kick it, so we accelerate. But I'm only going to... Um, give it a, but then I'm going to just step halfway across the, drift halfway across the time interval, and then I'll give it a, um, a, a, a second kick. And so we've kind of, um, as I say, instead of just kicking and drifting or drifting and kicking, we're using the midpoint to make the kicks and drifts more symmetric. Um, so this way is just a way of making the leapfrog method more more stable. I wanted to show you that. It's a way, especially a way of um, making things like energy conservation more stable or any conservation laws more stable. This is more symmetric forwards and backwards in time. So it has the effect of making energy conservation, other conservation laws more stable. Okay, so now I'm just going to go to my code 
for solving this problem of the two masses on the three springs. Uh, when we solve it numerically with the code, I'll first look at these um, normal modes, the two normal modes that we picked out, uh, to sort of validate the code. And then we'll look at a couple of other examples of um, non-normal non modes where we see other effects, other in kind of interesting effects. Okay, so uh, all my codes in one, one cell here. I've got a number of parameters in the problem. And so I've got to um, initialize those parameters for our two masses and uh, three springs. I've got to define my two masses and define my spring constants. So I wanted to make this general where we could have different masses and different spring constants. You could play around with different masses, different spring constants. So that's why I got M1 and M2 and K1, K2, K3, but numerically I just made them, um, the mass is the same, like our um, solution of the normal modes and the spring constants the same. Again, like our solution of the normal modes. So we're gonna, you know, in, in numerically solving this problem, we're gonna, um, just displace and we could also move our masses at time zero and then we're going to follow how those displaced and moved masses um, uh, change as a function of time we'll determine the solutions for x1 as a function of time x2 as a function of time so i need to specify the initial conditions of the masses that's the um, the other things i need to specify and so i'm going to specify x1 and x2 the initial positions of the masses here i made them just um 20 centimeters towards the right in both cases this is a normal mode um it's a normal mode if i release them from rest and so here i'm going to release the v1 and v2 the initial velocities i'm going to release my masses from rest Actually, all the examples I'm going to look at here, I'll just keep the initial velocities uh, at rest. Obviously, you can kind of interplay between displacing masses and giving masses velocities and get same solutions. Okay, so those are the initial conditions. <clears throat> we're solving it numerically. Um, so we're taking uh, continuous time and making it discrete time. Uh, we need to define the steps through time, and I'm going to keep track of time as I iteratively evaluate the positions x1, x2 of the masses as a function of time. So I've got a little timer, t, that I'm going to start out at zero, and I've got a little time in a, uh, uh, increment that is um, uh, 10 milliseconds here. Okay, so that's a bunch of parameters that we've initialized and that we need for the calculation. The acceleration of the two masses we had written down when we wrote down the couple differential equations. And so here I'm defining the initial accelerations of the two masses according to those equations in terms of the initial displacements of the two masses and so that's that's what i'm writing down here this this equation here is just that sum of the forces on the mass number one on the left hand side and this is just the sum of the forces on mass number two on the right hand side for example spring spring one which is the one on the left only acts on the left hand mass spring two sorry spring three which is the one on the right only acts on the second on the right hand mass mass two so those are the accelerations i wanted to we talked about the normal modes the normal mode frequencies i wanted to just calculate them and print them out as a reference point so let's say that the normal mode frequencies are the square root of km or 3km 
uh, it, it's easier to see when I make the plots later on the periods. And so here are the two corresponding periods for the two normal modes. I'm just going to make, as I go through the calculation, iterating for the position of mass number one and position of mass number two as a function of time, I'm just going to accumulate lists, Python lists, that contain, whose elements are the uh, masses, mass number one's position as a function of time, mass number two's position as a function of time, and, and the corresponding times themselves. So I'm just going to initialize these lists with the um, starting values, the initial conditions. <clears throat> and then I'm just going to um, I, I'm just going to walk through this um, calculation using the leapfrog method and um, this drift kick drift version of the leapfrog method um, for uh, 200 steps here I've done. So inside this while loop, while the time is less than 200, so this is going to be many, this is 200 seconds here. So this is many, many of those. Um, we made two, was it two millisecond steps? One, one no, 10 millisecond steps. Uh, so we're going to go through this um, 20,000 times uh until we reach 200 seconds uh here's where i do the drift to the midpoint the kick at the midpoint and then the drift to the end point so i drift to the midpoint so whatever speeds the two masses are moving at uh, I um, change their positions based on those speeds and half the time interval. I then kick the two masses. So this is where they get accelerated. And this is where their velocities get changed. So I accelerate them, I kick them to their new velocities. And then um, I drift a second time from the midpoint to the end point. And so this is this symmetric drift, kick, drift. And then I'm just going to update the time. Time's now a little bit later because I'm watching the time in my while loop. And then I'm just going to store the new positions of the two masses and the um, updated time in my, my list here. And then finally, after doing all that, so iterating for 200 seconds and finding the position of mass one as a function of time, position of mass two as a function of time over those 200 seconds, I'm just going to plot. Uh, I just plotted here positions as a, uh, the resulting positions as a function of time. Actually, to help us, I made not only the two most obvious plots, so that, that's these guys here. Um, I can plot the position of mass number one versus time. You'll see it os oscillate. I can plot the position of mass two as a function of time. We can see it oscillate. But I also plotted two other positions as a function of time. One is the sum of the positions of the two masses. So that would be kind of um, like plotting the, um, uh, the, this because they're equal masses, the center of mass. And the other one I plotted is the difference of the positions of the two masses. And so that, that um, represents their relative positions. And, and the sums and the differences of the positions of the two masses are interesting are uh, relevant to our discussion of these two normal modes, uh, where in one case the um, masses oscillate in phase, and in the other case the masses oscillate in out of phase. And we'll see that very clearly in these uh, plots of the sums of the positions and the differences of the positions. Anyway, so let's run this. 
And so here are my, my four, four plots. Let me remind you how we started these. So all the masses are the same, all the spring constants are the same, exactly the, the situation that where we found the normal modes. Um, I displaced the two masses in the same direction by the same amount, and I've released them from rest. I've got the two masses here, and I just shifted them 20 centimeters over here to one. Uh, to, to the right, and I let them go. So in red here, here's mass number one, and that's on the left, and in green here, that's mass number two on the right. You see that they're oscillating uh, sinusoidally, so this is a normal mode. You see that they're oscillating sinusoidally with the same characteristic frequency. So again, they're a normal, normal mode. Um, you see that they're oscillating with the same frequency and they're in phase. So at time zero, um, this sinusoidal wave is a peak and uh, it's a peak over here for the second mass. Um, it's uh, this trough down here and this trough down here are at the same time. So they're oscillating in, in phase. Um, the period, it's a little hard to see. So we calculated the period of this particular oscillation to be about 6.3 seconds. And if you look at the time between adjacent peaks here, or maybe easier, adjacent troughs down here, it looks like it must be about 6.3 seconds. So this is that, that first normal mode where the two masses are oscillating in phase with one another. Uh, you can see this really clearly in these two bottom plots. So the one on the left on the bottom in, in black is the sum of the two positions. And the one on the right is the difference of the two positions. <clears throat> so the difference is just zero. We displaced both masses by the same amount from the equilibrium point. And then they just oscillate in phase to and fro. So they're always the same distance apart in this normal mode. Uh, they're oscillating about the equilibrium points, their equilibrium points. So the sum of x1 plus x2 is oscillating to and fro, but the difference between x1 and x2, x that's a constant in this normal mode. <clears throat> the other normal mode is when, again, we're gonna displace the two masses, but one we're gonna pull to the right, and one to the left, so like this or we could push one to the left and one to the right, kind of like this, and then release, release those. Um, so here would be an example of that. The, the amplitudes of the displacements are the same, um, but the signs or the phases are opposite. So this is like starting them with an opposite phase. And if we run this one, so, Again, we see a normal mode because we got sinusoidal oscillations of X1 and X2. Uh, and we see a normal mode, the, the two, two frequencies are the same. These two frequencies, if you think about the last part, these are higher frequencies. These are shorter periods and they correspond to this period here, the 3.6 seconds. So it's hard to read on this plot, obviously, but this distance here is 3.6 seconds and it's 3.6 seconds over here. So there's a higher frequency, higher, uh, higher energy normal mode. Um, if we walk downstairs to these plots of the sum of the positions and the difference of the positions, we see the reverse of what we saw last time. So now if we look at the sum, um, the sum of the two positions, that's gonna be zero. Because when this one moves towards the um, right, this one is moving towards the left and vice versa. So the sum is zero, but the difference, you can see they get close 
and they get far apart. They get close and they get far apart. So um, this is clearly what, what type of normal mode this is. Maybe you look at some other examples. Supposing I started by just displacing one. So this doesn't correspond to either of those two normal modes. Um, now, if I, what's going to happen? Well, if the, there wasn't that spring in between them. Obviously, um, uh, if you just display, say, the one on the left, and there was no spring connect coupling them, then the one on the left would oscillate, and the one on the right would not would not oscillate. Um, that spring couples their motion together. And because of that spring right, if ever you touch the one on the right, move in, you're gonna stretch or compress that spring. You're gonna exert a force on the one on the left. So you unavoidably will start moving the one on the, on the right. Uh, so, so let's see how that happens in this situation. <clears throat> and um, so here's the results. So here's the position of mass one. Here's the position of mass two in, in red and green. You see, we started mass one uh, with a displacement. Uh, so that stretched or compressed the springs um, on the left and in the center. We, we started mass two with no displacement. But we just argue that as soon as you move mass one, because of the coupling spring, there'd be a force on mass two. And so they're both going to move. And so they move in, in, in this complicated manner here uh, when you look at position one or just position two. In there are, you know, those two, frequ two frequencies of the, the normal modes buried in there. You see them more clearly, again, if you look at the differences between the positions of the masses. So if you look at the differences and the sums of the positions of the masses, you see that the sums of the positions actually oscillates with um, uh, that frequency corresponding to the um, first normal mode, the lower frequency, and the difference oscillates at that frequency corresponding to that um, higher frequency of the normal mode. So it's it, it is this one here. Uh, so buried in this, you know, what looks like complicated motion, that's not simple sinusoidal motion, is a sinusoidal motion if you could just focus on the center of mass and the difference between the locations of the masses. Um, <clears throat> you know, this space of the, the masses of the two objects and the spring constants of the three springs and the initial conditions in terms of positions and velocities of the two masses. I mean, this is an enormous space of parameters that you could play with. I just wanted to show you one more. Um, suppose, we make the spring that's coupling together the two masses, make that um, a, a much weaker spring than the springs on the two ends. So now this is kind of like weak, a weak coupling between the two masses. So they, they barely, they talk to each other a little bit, barely talk to each other compared to, um, you know, um, if, if they were completely isolated to one another, what, what their characteristic frequencies will be then. And so in this case, you, you see these two plots, which are kind of interesting. Um, and they're kind of re reminiscent of a phenomena you know well, that if you um, mix together two frequencies that are nearby frequencies, you get a feeding effect. Um, you get a beating effect where you see a high frequency, which is related to the sum of the frequencies, and you see a low frequency which is related to the difference of the frequencies. 
and um, that's that's what's happening in in this this situation here, basically. Um, that weak coupling um, of the that that that, we, that central spring uh, that is weak and produces a weak coupling compared to those um, strong springs that produce the natural frequencies of the masses is that they were isolated. Those those become like two different free, two different frequencies that we're seeing in this data here. If we remove the coupling. I haven't tried this before, but I wanted to try it. Then we should just see the um, one mass oscillate, yeah. So then we just see this situation, of course, um, because no longer do the masses talk to one another. <laughs> 